You are now listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legank and David Lawler. If you like sex and violence, evil brunettes, and angelic blondes, then stick with us as we debate some of the best and worst of action and exploitation filmmaking. Yes! All right. So, uh, oh, shit. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> that was the best intro I've heard all day. Yes. <laughs> Ever, All right, huh? so, uh, shit, what are we doing? Huh? Yes! Welcome to Extreme Cinema. I'm Andrew Legank with David Lawler, and we're here to talk about Peter Hyams. We're doing three movies tonight. Uh, Time Cop, uh, Stay Tuned, and Running Scared. What would you little maniacs like to do first? How are you, Andrew? I'm doing good, I'm doing good. Doing we're good. doing our ESPN Sports Night Voices yes. today on ESPN. My name's David. What does David mean? David means business, baby. <laughs> Fuck you, David. Fuck you. Yeah, that's my message for you. Fuck you and kiss my ass. Okay. <laughs> this is Peter Hyams. Uh, uh, this, you know, this is a guy I respect the hell out of. He is. He's incredible. He's a great director and a great cinematographer. He's a great talent. He's got. He's done some amazing work across the board. And if I'm not mistaken, he shot all three of these movies as well as directing them. He did. But th- th- this this is another guy like John Badham, and a few others from like say the '80s whose movies we saw. I mean, they were just they were all over the theaters. They were all over cable TV. Oh yeah, they were everywhere. And 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 um, I think the first. Oh man, you know. I wish I wish we had time to do Star Chamber because I, that's one of my favorites of his. I really like that movie a lot too. I, I watched the Presidio just just just, to, just as part of watching you know Peter Himes movies. I meant to watch which one's uh, a, is that the one with Christopher Outland, Lambert? But I could never sit through Outland. I, I enjoyed Outland. I liked it. It was high noon set on a on a space station with Sean Connery. Yeah, I know that's itch. Everybody was always excited about the pitch. Well, the pitch was it's high noon in outer space and that got the movie made. So everybody was like, ooh. I remember, I remember so what I, I to do is set one movie in another place and, and set it in outer space and then I get my movie made. <laughs> I was like, Eh. Well, I, the other movies have, have kind of combined formulas in that way, too. You know, they, oh, yeah. it's like if you take one element and put it like Pretty Woman meets uh, Runaway or something or <laughs> something like that. You know, you remember the player, the Robert Altman film where it was all the, oh, yeah. all the executives were just like, it's this meets that. You know, oh, like, yeah. OK, yeah. You, here, take my money. Like, like, <laughs> I like that and pass the player. cocaine. That's a good movie. Uh, yeah, it's okay. But Robert Altman to me is like one of the most overrated directors. He's a guy who's I can't stand Altman, but I like the player. He's like I, I try to like a lot of movies that he, you know, because I'm I, you know, I was Fuck being him. a film student, and and Altman is like Fuck him. All the people talking at the same time. Fuck that. I crap. enjoyed. I'll tell you, I liked Mash, and I liked the player. Uh, oh, I did like Shortcuts. Shortcuts was okay. Oh, Shortcuts was awesome. Yeah. yeah, Shortcuts in the player. So he had that brief moment in the 90s where, like, I was connected with him. Other than that, man, fuck that. Guy. I think I think the dementia made him just right as a filmmaker. <laughs> That's what happened. Yes. Yes. Not okay! I mean, from what I understand, <laughs> Altman didn't really... Um... The Alzheimer's was at just the right point. He, <laughs> yeah, uh, from what I understand about Robert Altman, he didn't do anything. I mean, like, he just sat in a chair, basically, in another room while other people made his movie, and he got to put his name on it. That's... You know, I mean, like Andy office. Andy Sidaris had a story about that. Andy Sidaris. Yeah, Andy Sidaris, because Andy Sidaris shot the football scene in Mash, because Altman didn't know number one. Andy Sidaris, the the the, the B filmmaker yeah. who made all those titty movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He started off he because he worked for for Altman. Yeah, because the studio he worked Andy Sidaris is early in his career worked for uh, ABC's Wild, Wide World Sports and and was the cameraman for their football games. So right. they hired him as a creative consultant to help with to help to only just you know give a few pointers for the football scene that occurs in Mash toward the end of the movie. Um, oh, Altman didn't know a damn thing about football and he didn't know anything about shooting action and he didn't know anything about shooting sports. So Sidaris basically he directed the scene, he placed the cameras and everything, and he never once spoke to Altman. Altman didn't talk to him at all. He said Altman was too busy getting high in the back most of the time, just smoking weed and getting high, and they didn't even give him credit. And he went to Fox and he said, I want my credit for this movie. He said, we're not going to give you the credit, but we'll give you this. They gave him some money and they gave him like um, some kind of a certificate suitable for framing that said 20th Century Fox 
uh, is grateful to you for your contributions to MASH. So, you know, but he didn't even get a credit, which is really fucked up. They do that to a lot of people who do a lot of work. And, they, you know, it's like it's like they don't want yeah. anyone to know that people on the outside, people who are not in the know in the business had any help, uh, you know, contributed in any way to these movies. Uh-huh. So, OK, let's let's start with Running Scared. Uh, yeah. 1986. I remember seeing this movie. Um, I believe I went with a friend or a friend of the family, something like that. We just went in to see it. And it, I remember really, really enjoying the movie when I saw it a, l- a long time ago in the theater. It was one of the few R-rated movies I was allowed to see. Pussy. <laughs> My mother didn't really like take me to R-rated <laughs> movies. It's really uncomfortable <laughs> when you're watching. I had to see The Terminator by myself in 1984. Pussy. What have we got? Let me tell you something. When you've been cops this long, you are not fit for anything else. We're looking for some new career challenges. Yeah, something with a future. Show me another career they let you shoot people. Give us your money. You're mugging us? I don't believe this. You better believe it or you're dead. Oh, come on, let us keep the driver's licenses and the snapshots. And our badges. I can't believe that you missed all six shots. What are you talking about? I hit the windshield six times in a row. I'm the one who made him swerve. Oh, you made him swerve? Yes, sir. You always aim low anyway. Oh, good. Nagging me now. Nagging is good. You owe me ten bucks and I never said anything. You want it now? Yeah, I want it now. Did I come at a bad time? (laughs) Follow that car. Oh, now you're going to criticize my driving? Well, it's just that you get to do all the dangerous stuff and I get to parallel park. I love this job. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm younger than you. (laughs) When you say by yourself, you were in the theater by yourself or... No, I know. I was there. I was there with a with a mother of a friend of mine. Like, but you know, my my parents let me go to see the Terminator basically alone. Okay, so we have Billy Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines. They're cops with a sense of humor. Oh, they're awesome. They such a, like great the greatest rapport. Really, like, I mean, it's it's amazing the rapport that they have. Yeah, to yeah. They do. A, they do. A, a, they're better than. They're definitely. They're a lot better than Richard Dreyfuss and Emilio Estevez. But that's oh, yeah. because I think they had time before they started shooting to just spend time together, get to know each other's movements and rhythms, and start to become friends because they, they bounce off of each other so effortlessly. Oh, it's so it, – like it, it's like it, 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 you don't get the feeling that they're ad-libbing, but, but, but you also – it's so natural that it's hard to, to, to imagine that they're not ad-libbing. Like, um, yeah, yeah. The, everything just just flows between the two of them, and it's really amazing. You rarely see that. I mean, even between you know, uh, well, say you know Mel Gibson and Danny Glover, yeah. it, it's it's not, nothing close to to the to the chemistry that these guys have. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I were to like compare a Lethal Weapon movie to Running Scared, it'd probably be Lethal Weapon Four because that that had no script. There was no script. They were just improvising. Completely right. from from beginning to end. That's why there's very yeah, little story going on. I mean, what Jet Li's in it, I think, right? And yeah, Chris Rock. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't good though. You know, it's like I, 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 Lethal Weapon Two. I, I mean, they, where they where they, they 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 really found their rapport together, the two guys. Mm-hmm. I, I think, and, and there was still a story, and it was still interesting. Yeah, yeah. And but still, I, I have to say that, that 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 their rapport doesn't doesn't really match up to Billy no, Crystal. No, it doesn't. Uh, and, 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 yeah, I mean, like, well, I think I think, you know, Billy Crystal's was a, he is a stand up comedian, and Gregory Hines is a dancer. You know, so they right. I, I, there was this all around kind of entertaining thing going on. It was like a lot of showmanship ship going on. Yeah. So what uh, what what do we have here? We have Jimmy Smith, who is playing this um, drug lord, Jose Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Yes. Uh, so we, and the one thing I noticed is that the first 20 minutes of the movie is nonstop. It just it starts off with them playing basketball. They're playing basketball in some courtyard or something. Very little structure to the story at all. It's like, yeah. like in that in that regard, like like it doesn't follow um, screenwriting rules of the time. It just sort of starts. I, without... I think I think what happened was they had a script. 
because I believe right. it was written the original. Um, if, if I looked up the trivia for the movie, it was originally written for two older actors, and it was supposed to be about two older actors on the edge of retirement who are gonna go and open up a bar in Key West. I fart in your general direction. Don't waste my motherfucking time. But uh, they decided to go with younger people. Well, somebody came along, I think, and said, "Turn this into Beverly Hills Cop." <laughs> yeah. And and uh, and whoever, whichever one of the writers that is, whether it's Gary DeBoer or the other guy, um, did that. I mean, there may be uncredited writers too. I don't know. Um, and what did a masterful job at at realizing what made Beverly Hills Cop tick and adding it to this story. And that's one of the things that I love about it. So much. And also allowing, I guess, giving the movie to Crystal and Hines to restructure with their right. back and forth that was going because their improvisations make up a good percentage of, of, of what's going on. It does, but but you know, like um, you know, you've heard me talk about tone issues in movies, right? Yeah, before. yeah. Like, and, and this this movie is one of the most deft at handling those tone issues that I've ever seen. You know why? You know, I figured because you said that before when we were talking about like stakeout. Um, I yeah. think the reason it works more is because Crystal and Heinz are more believable in this, in these roles than Dreyfus and Estevez were, and you you buy them you 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 buy them together you buy them as yeah I it, you know I mean how cool is it when 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 they're they're you know they're going in to, to they're tracking Julio and they're 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 tracking their uh, they're tracking uh, uh, um, uh, Joe Pantoliano. Right. And they, they find they find the van full of fucking Uzis. <laughs> yeah. And they're like and, and what you know, he's like, Yeah, everyone in there has one of these. Mm. And like <laughs> Uzis, and, yeah. And, uh, and he's like and he's like, you know, yeah, we better both go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <It's> like, <laughs> yes, I mean, yes. And it's like it's totally straight faced, you know, it's like 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 they're serious, like go. Yeah, no, we better both go. Like, <laughs> so, but the, the, the whole movie starts off, it starts on the basketball court, and then it proceeds for another 20 minutes until we get a little more story, I think involving Crystal's ex-wife, played by Darlene Flugel, who was also in To Live and Die in L.A., um, well, yeah, but you got to, you got to, you know, the thing they do to snake with the, with the 20, with the, with the uh, $50,000. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, the hood watch thing. He's got a yeah, briefcase full of $50,000. They book him, they take him in and it's all, it's all kind of like straight action. And then we get into the, um, the police precinct. Their boss is played by Dan Hedaya. Uh, and he's awesome. And then, and then, um, I, I Heinz seems to spend a lot of his time having sex with the hooker, you know, and yeah. great ass. Meanwhile, I don't know you, 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 if there was a problem. I think there were there was maybe two problems with the entire movie, but I'll get to those in a minute. There, there's a couple of great lines. I love the ex I, I I have Darlene Flugel. I know you were just talking about that. I don't want me to interrupt mm. you. Wait, wait, but I want to bring you back to that point. There's this subtext in all the scenes that she's in with with Billy Crystal, and it's so deep. For for a movie like this, I mean this this is this is a superficial movie, really. You know, it's a, it's a guy movie. You mean how the kind of like when they're having when when they're when they have dialogue between each other, it's very like she can't get him because she's in love with him, and like I, and yeah, and so, she, yeah, like, I got that indication, and, he, and like they, he's the same way, like like and like you feel this thing between them. It's yeah. it's very unusual for. Uh, for for something like that to be in a movie like this, that's also like, you know I mean like uh, Billy Crystal, he doesn't really tend to get like notices for his acting, but I thought he was really right. strong here because he's a completely different person with her than he is with Hines, and that's how yeah. people are. Like y you know you might yell at somebody and then turn and be tender with your wife or something like that. That's just how people right. are. And and he still and both of them would still get get upset with each other and say things that like you know that they didn't want to say because they were upset with each other. Yeah. But but you could see in spite of that. Like both of them are so good at it, you can tell that these two people like like have this connection and and and, and hate it that they're not together. Right. And, and you feel. Yeah. It. Apparently, like, like she's going to get married to a dentist. <laughs> but we, and he makes all these jokes about it, you know, the clown painting. But and we all never this stuff. we never see the dentist. I'm, I might as well get into my problem. The only problem I had, I felt like th I felt like they needed another two or three minutes in the movie to. You know, just just a couple of extra bits with them. 
I, I would have liked some better ending ending stuff there too. I thought they they tied it up too fast at the end, and they and it's like, well, we're not moving, we're we're not going to retire now. Where you know it's all over. You know, you guys you guys are going to have to work with us now. You know, it's like, and I'm and by the way, I'm you know I'm getting back with my wife, and this all happened in the space of of you know killing Julio and the fucking state building. You know, right. it, it, it's too neat. The the story picks up when I guess Billy Crystal's aunt dies. Leaves him forty thousand dollars. His ex-wife is getting married. Uh, they talk about buying a Mondo Laserdisc stereo, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. But there was a recent suicide that turned out to be a cop working the South Side, and that's where you get your tone changed. But it, it, it's a it's 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 a more realistic um, idea. It's like kind of like we were talking about Mash earlier. You know how there's all this horrible shit that goes on, but these people they have to maintain some air of professionalism, and part of that is to just try to make jokes, try to have a sense of humor about this. Otherwise, my you're going to go nuts. My wife has a name for it. It's called Gallows Humor. Gallows Humor. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so they shake down Pantaleano, take mo most of his money so that he will wear a wire and implicate his boss, Gonzalez, played by Jimmy Smith. Uh, Pantaleano double-crosses them, threatens a, poor, uh, not, a Colombian necktie. Uh, Gonzalez's thugs are actually cops. They're undercover. They're played by Stephen Bauer and John Grise. Uh, and I didn't even. It took me a little while to recognize Stephen Bauer, because he oh, was no, covered. He was covered Stephen in Bauer. hair and a beard. I mean, like he had a, a lot of hair and a big beard. Yeah, he's a big hairball. Mm -hmm. And then Jonathan, Jonathan Grise or Grease or whatever the hell his name is. You know, we we know him from way back. Yeah, I've seen him know. in so many things. So we have a big shootout. Smiths flees. This and the action has been ca carrying on for thirty five minutes. The way this is edited is such a breakneck fashion. They're running around. We have okay. So so the movie is kind of like broken up into three parts, right? You have the first part, the initial tracking down of Gonzalez, and all the shooting out, and then the second part, which is the vacation to Key West, and then the third right. part is them coming back because they have a plan. Uh, but. They blow the undercover operation. They get yelled at by their boss, and they're put on leave. And they're too careful and all this stuff, which is kind of humorous and silly. I was thinking fun. these guys are inseparable, and they could, this could have been a television show. It really seriously could have been a television show. It could have been. Where you have it these guys have getting into all these adventures would be very popular. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they come up with this idea. I, they go to Key West. It looks great. Shine sweet freedom. Shine a light on me. A little Michael mm -hmm. McDonald montage of Key West. Girls in bikinis having good times. So they decide to retire, cash in their pensions, and open a bar in Key West. And this is where I'm beginning to see how well they work together and how their dialogue feels improvised. A lot of the back and forth give and take that's going on. Promise me we'll get shot at <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, but they assume that Gonzalez was arrested he's going to go through. But it turns out it's a star chamber situation, apparently, because he gets let off on a technicality. So right. they decide to delay their retirement and go after Gonzalez. And, and and there are these uh, subtleties, what we were talking about with the gallows humor, but with the mix of humor and the cop drama. And I, that's where my theory about Heinz and Crystal being more believable than other actors pulling this off. Because they don't look like movie stars, right? <laughs> and right. No. they dress, they almost dress like homeless people in this movie, practically. <laughs> well, it's Chicago cops, I guess. Chicago, you know. Okay, so they come up with a plan. Okay, we'll nail Gonzalez and then we'll retire. Right. So... They start, they start casing, they start you know, canvassing the area, looking for Gonzalez. And there's a scene that I had to show. I had to show both Bronwyn and Regan because th this kid reminds me so much of Regan. <laughs> they go and they <laughs> interrogate this, um, this uh, Spanish woman, and her kid is behind them, giving <laughs> Heinz the finger all the time. And he's just giving Heinz the finger. And I'm like, this is Regan. This is me when I was in fifth grade. I did As soon as I figured out what the middle finger was, I started giving everybody the finger. Was that the same with you? <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I never did that. I was, when I was, I, I, well, when I was in fifth grade, there was a kid who sat in front of me named Charles. And I used to go, hey, Charles. And he would turn around and I'd give him the finger. <laughs> and he would just give me, he would shoot daggers at me with his eyes. I, I love Gregory. Hines. Yeah, there's a payoff. Like, he opens the door and goes, Yes! Yeah! <laughs> I don't know Julio Gonzalez. Go away. We know he used to live here, and if you don't cooperate, you're going to have a lot of trouble with every inspector in Chicago. We can arrange for the city to deliver garbage instead of picking it up. Go away pronto. I know nothing. Would you like us to go door to door checking green cars? I tell you, go away, no questions. I don't think the owner of this slum is going to be real happy if all of his tenants were deported. The owner is Julio Gonzalez. We'll begin by deporting you. He has a senorita at the Camino Real Apartments. Maybe he's there. I don't know. Do you need a lettuce crisper? 
Come in right now. One second. Yes! <laughs> it's a. I was like, this is a comedy. I mean, like, obviously, this is yeah. this is a. This is a payoff of a joke. I mean, it's like, he's like, let's go. He says, okay, hang on a second. And he knocks on the door. The kid opens and goes, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, that is awesome. I mean, that's like a great... Okay, so then we move forward. It's, 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 Smiths takes a woman hostage in his underwear in the apartment building that they were just in. Demands, and he demands their he pants. He demands their pants. <laughs> so, uh, what, Billy Crystal, I think, takes off his pants first, tries to throw them, and but he misses... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gregory Hines has to take off his pants, and they're both in their long johns. And then uh, he ta- he steals their cop car, which has been graffiti laden. I think what it, it said something like "police car, unmarked police car." I think is what it said. Yeah. Somebody spray painted "unmarked police car." Jimmy Smith is a good looking guy. I want to say that. I'm going to get that out the open. Right there. Did he get you hard? <laughs> you might say. I mean, well, I was a little bit. There's something about uh, he, he, something about his eyes, the shape of his face. He's kind of like a like a Hispanic Harrison Ford. Hello, handsome. So there's a big drug sting at the airport, but he has the drug shipped with an unweeding witting priest and nun, and with a real haul escape from the airport. And then we have this great chase scene that is, it's it's a lot like to live and die in L.A., but. Not quite as good. I guess Friedkin, the way he was shooting that, the, the chase scene in To Live and Die in L.A. is like a centerpiece of the movie, so we put a lot of time and effort into it. But yeah. for this movie, you're kind of mixing comedy and humor, you know, and, and the cop drama. So he, he the way this is shot, it's, it's very inventive because they wind up ch- literally on the train tracks chasing Jimmy Smith in his car. I, I thought that that was that you know, and at the time that the movie was put out, I remember the the giant deal they made of the 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 chase on the tracks, and and I thought that that that's one of, that's one of the action sequences that really falls flat in the movie. I think they did mean it's, it to be a homage, though, an homage to to live and die in L.A. To, yeah, to, well, to live and die in L.A. and also, well, I mean, but they, how are you going to do a homage to a movie that was made like a year before? I don't know. Maybe they were impressed, or maybe maybe they're stunt coordinators. Maybe people who worked on the movie were like, "Hey, we should do what we did in to live and die in L.A." You know, and maybe they looked at the movie. And that something. was a failure of a movie that came out a year before. It's like, hey, let's do an homage. Let's do well, an yeah, homage yeah, yeah. to the Howard. The movie, the Duck. movie didn't make any money, but it was well respected, I guess, because it did get really good reviews. I mean, I, you know, and, and, and you know, you have to be an idiot to 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 to, to not know that the um, the car chases in Live and Die in L.A. were fucking awesome. Oh yeah. Um, so okay, that was Friedkin trying to top himself from French Connection with the chase scene under the elevator tracks in New York. Remember? I don't think I don't think he made it there. I, I think that that was that, that you know that really with train tracks and stuff and and the way it's shot. I think that that for for him that was a fail. And I, I actually think if you if you look at the, some of his later movies like Narrow Margin and uh, um, there's another one I'm yeah, Narrow Margin in particular where he tries to make up for for that and and does some stuff with trains and and cars that that are that, that's that, that's far superior to what happened in there i think i think that, that he thought that he failed there too he might have but, but i think it was for comedic effect mainly because the car is on literally on the railroad tracks it's about to impact right. with another with a train uh but luckily that train has a cow catcher on the front of it so it just sort of flips the car over or something but they managed to get up but smith still manages to get away i mean this guy he's he's like um he's like houdini or something the way he pulls it off he's a slippery motherfucker so but he's rather brilliant because he mixes real cocaine with fake cocaine and pottery shit from columbia and um crystal and heinz they torture their snits with uh, their snitch with threats of bad tattoos and we have yeah. again more great interplay between heinz and crystal uh, now there's a great bit there where Jimmy Smith puts them in and their yellow cab car, uh, cab cop car, because what happened? Okay, their car was so badly damaged they got their, this guy who was also in the Star Chamber plays the cop mechanic, and he right. he he like refurbishes a yellow cab and and, and he was the cab driver from uh, he was duly the cab driver from um, planes, trains, and automobiles. Right, as well. right. He's like this guy, uh, he's like really tall, he's got a very long face, but he has excellent delivery. He's like a real, he's got a real uh, like charm about him as an actor, I guess. Oh, he's also, yeah. I think he was also in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest playing one of the crazies in that. That sounds sounds about right. In that ward with Jack Nicholson. Um, mm-hmm. They put, okay, so, but he modifies this yellow cab car with bulletproof glass and everything. They get, they get dumped into this garbage, uh, this garbage truck 
uh, basically Smith wants uh, Smith wants his cocaine back, and my coke. <laughs> And then and then they're sitting in the car and he's like, "This guy's beginning to get on my nerves. Since when do I owe you ten dollars?" He just <laughs> just comes out of there, uh, you know. And I think again, non scripted doesn't really feel scripted in that sense because uh, writers the way they are. Um, and Gary Devore uh, he has a, he had a very interesting history that I looked up after I saw the movie. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that in a minute. He disappeared, right? Did he, he did he ever reappear? No, he never did. He, he never did. Um, but it's these little things that you pick up when you're on the way. I mean, there was like, there's always so much when you, you're writing a script, and then if you have the opportunity to actually shoot the script or something like that, and you're working on it, and and y- y- your actors are more than capable of understanding who their characters are and what their relationship is with each other, then they can go ahead and just take what you've done and, and make it more real by doing this back and forth and that's how they managed to really that's how they that, that's that's why it feels so real to me watching it right. so they take uh, they actually steal jimmy smith's mercedes which looks like it could use a little work on the suspension and the axles wouldn't you agree yeah. it's bouncing around a little too much for its weight <laughs> and then we have an 80s music montage with climax singing man Size love which i have in my head and i keep like I love that song. It's really good. They have good music in this movie. Man sounds the cat. <laughs> da, 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 da. And then also the Michael McDonald song, which I kept um, singing. And every time I sang Shine Sweet Freedom, Shine a Light on Me, my daughter grabbed a flashlight and shined it on me. <laughs> a little pain in my ass over there. Movies were fun back then. This this movie is so much fun. Crystal and Hines, I, I was thinking, they, they look like they're having so much fun making this movie. So they make a phone call on this enormous car phone. Did you see how big that car phone was? I know. It's like giant. Yeah. This is back in the days of cellular telephones. So I was thinking you don't script all this crazy shit, all these humorous interludes. Now, getting into Gary DeVore, this is so weird. He was a Hollywood screenwriter best known for Raw Deal. He wrote Raw Deal. And for his bizarre death in 1997, he wrote Raw Deal and another movie called Showdown in Little Tokyo. Mm-hmm. As well as a few uncredited rewrites for Peter Hyams, he helped uh, polish the scripts for Time Cop, Sudden Death, and The Relic. Mm. He disappeared in June of 1997 while driving at night from Santa Fe to Santa Barbara, prompting extensive search and media speculation. A year later, he and his car were discovered submerged below a bridge over the California aqueduct in Palmdale. And there was a uh, documentary that was made about it, The Writer with No Hands. Because for some reason, the hands that they found in the car were 200 years old and did not belong to Gary DeVore. Wow. (laughs) Broadcaster Sean Stone, who is the son of Oliver Stone and who oddly converted to Islam in 2012, compared the mystery over DeVore's fate to that of JFK. Okie dokie. All right, Jimmy Jimmy Houston has very few credits. I wasn't. Uh, he he wrote My Best Friend is a Vampire, Final Exam, Death Driver, and Dark Sunday. I'm guessing all kind of like low budget, perhaps direct to video yeah. horror films. Now, okay, right. Now we can get to the part that I that I. This would have been a perfect movie for me, uh, if they had done something different with this. For some reason, Jimmy Smith abducts Darlene Flugel. That's the only beat in the script that feels too movie like for me because this isn't a damn damsel in distress movie it's a buddy cop comedy thriller that's where i felt like it it didn't ring true for me that part i was okay with it because it it forced the story to move forward and how does he know anything about her how does he know anything about her abducting her take you know and well he was over there and he just sort of took an opportunity was kind of the way it was played out in the in the story and yeah it is a little bit contrived i would you know that's why i said we maybe a little a couple more minutes with the two of those characters or something try to uh, yeah that would have cleared it up you could you could have made an excuse or whatever something yeah yeah that's that's the only thing that didn't ring true for me but it gets a little morally ambiguous because um, they grab, they steal, they get the cocaine. They get um, Jimmy Smith's cocaine from storage. One guy? <laughs> yeah. You're going to give millions of dollars in cocaine to one guy? <laughs> <laughs> so they get, a, you know, um, they they go to the drop-off site, which is, uh, you know, Gregory Hines climbs up the side of this magnificent building. It looks like a mall or a convention center or something like that, right? It's the state building. Uh, I guess it's, um, they, they call it the state building 
where where I guess uh, state business is done in Chicago. But it was still un- yeah. under construction at the time, so. Right. He shoots through the window, drops down the line, firing a machine gun wildly at everything while hanging from the line. This is very exciting stuff. They finally yeah. shoot Jimmy Smith, but he pulls a nurse hand, of course, because all the bad guys always do that, and he won't die until they finally do it. But uh, other than that, I mean, I feel like the, the Billy Crystal Darling Flugel relationship could have used the extra two or three minutes to develop it a little more we spend more time i think developing heinz and crystal more than anything else but this this is a great movie i can't recommend it enough it's so much fun it is so much fun it really is and and that was why i made this announcement to you that at the age of almost 42 i have decided that after all these years of never picking a movie never admitting to or being able to pick a movie that I was at my actual favorite that watching this movie, I have to say that if I were given two hours to live and told that I could watch a movie, I'd watch this movie like that. This is my favorite movie. Okay. Because it makes me happy. Like I, I love, I know. This yeah. Movie. It made me happy. I, like it did. It made me happy watching it. And if I had two hours to live and I was going to watch a movie in those two hours, I'd, I'd watch Running Scared. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know if I, I can. I, I, I don't know if I can answer that question. I, there's so many movies that I love. There's so many movies. Um, I don't know, man. I'd rather just beg for my life. <laughs> yeah, I know. Please don't kill me, man. Don't I'll kill me. Do. I think I'd rather rather have sex with my wife. Or something <laughs> yeah, for yeah, yeah, the yeah. Last two hours, exactly. But, like, but if uh, that's why I, that's why I preface it with. Let, if I was going to watch a movie with those last two hours, like I would it has watch to be a movie. movie. But like, like most likely, there would be something else I would want to do with my last two hours of my. Well, life. you still got fourteen but... minutes. You know, <laughs> maybe fourteen minutes after that to fill up the two hours. So you know, I met Gregory Hines um, a long time ago. Uh, he you? was directing a movie in my neighborhood yeah. on my block on the Upper East Side. It was the movie at the time. It was called White Man's Burden. They changed the title because obviously, I guess there was a John Travolta movie being made. Uh, right. I think it's about a white guy who dates a black girl or something like that. Anyway, he directed the movie. It was a low budget production, but they the crew invited me to craft services on the street. I got to meet him. He's a very nice guy. He was a very nice guy. He's no longer with us, unfortunately. Yeah, um, he passed on a while. He's back. a guy I, I, I've always loved in any movie. I thought he was great. History of the World Part One and uh, uh, Wolfen and and White Knights. Uh, you know, White whatever he did, yeah. he was always a great spark. Oh, uh, Cotton Club. He, he he was good in everything that he was in, regardless of the quality or the overall outcome of the picture. He's like, he always enormously even entertaining. In, even in Eve of Destruction, he was Eve good. of Destruction running around. Now, stay tuned, okay, which is the next movie we're going to talk about. Yeah. Peter Hyam should have gotten an Oscar for his cinematography for this movie. It is staggering what how he shoots this movie. It's incredible. But unfortunately, it's a movie that no one likes, really. It didn't get much in the way of good reviews it didn't get didn't make any money so it didn't make a splash so you're gonna have to make the case to me is why he should win an oscar he for should have he should have won an oscar for the cinematography for stay tuned it is beautifully shot it's it, there are so many different techniques and styles that were utilized in the make and he did he oh there's a lot yeah there, there's a I lot i mean of time cop is beautifully up. shot too but I, I would say stay tuned kind of tops it because he's doing so many so many different things with the form you know, it's he's shooting in yeah. m- different formats. He's doing things that uh, would be done years later, you know, but he was doing this with film, which is just staggering to me. I mean, I was watching it just for that, really. I mean, we, it, it yeah. became obvious it was really hard to follow this movie because you're jumping through it. But uh, are we ready to launch into Stay Tuned? Uh, yeah. All right, Let's kids, do don't try this at home. What do we got? Sorry to disturb you at this hour, but I have something you want. A new TV? It broadcast programs no one had ever seen. Wednesday at 9, don't miss an all-new episode of The Silencer of the Lambs. Then one night, Roy and Helen Nabel got sucked in and discovered that hell (laughs) is one TV show after another. Let's welcome our new contestants, Roy and Helen they're starring in every show. I've watched enough wrestling to know one thing. It's all fake. No one ever gets it. Not fake. Not fake. 
So the object the in The object, it. Mr. Pierce, is to kill them before they reach the end. Oh, my God. We're cartoons. I am not a mouse. I'm Helen Nabel. I have two beautiful children. Mom? Our parents are trapped in television. Now, they can't go home. They can only switch channels. Where'd he go? Hey, lady, watch out! And every series is a nightmare. That's entertainment. Because Satan is the sponsor. Okay, everybody, head spins. Very good, very nice. Well, time to rock and roll. Star me up. You got to star me up. This comedy from hell. Please, party time That'll save her. Not Stay tuned. Where have you been? Uh, right. Uh, now John Ritter, you got John Ritter and Pam Dauber, okay? And this is obvious stunt casting because they're two. They were two, uh, two TV actors. two of the biggest TV actors of their time, which was the late seventies. And they were has beens at the time. <laughs> so was, like, you know. I would well. I did want to mention Pam looks really cute in this movie. Actually, she looks hot. She's, she she's got some nice she legs does. too. She's in a rut with her television obsessed husband, who's played by John Ritter. John Ritter is this guy who just sits in front of you. He's like a, he's he's what you would call an early adopter today, right? He like. He right. has all these uh, the television, video, you know, cable and all this stuff. Jeffrey Jones uh, basically you know, comes to his house. I think um, Pam Dauber is just about ready to leave John Ritter because he just ignores her, which I think is crazy because, again, I, like I said, she's gorgeous. And, and he just watches the TV all the time. And it's... Yeah, that's just foolishness, man. <laughs> go go have sex with your yes, wife. Yes, I know, bro. I know. Or, or act like you care, dude. That's all you have to do is act like you care. Yeah, it's not that hard. Yeah, I. Have, but like more importantly, have sex with your wife. <laughs> so he has a son who is um who who's like some kind of a video geek himself and has figured out how to uh, send satellite recordings and all that stuff of whatever he's doing. He's kind of like a video pirate or, a, or what you would call a hacker or something like that. I don't know. Yes, he's definitely a uh, um, hardware, you know. He seems to wire stuff together in weird ways. To for for what end? I'm not 100 yeah, percent sure. Yeah. But. You are now listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legank and David Lawler. Um. Yeah. So famous Hollywood uh, pedophile Jeffrey Jones shows up at the. At the yeah, uh, couple's house. Yeah, there's always that to taint it, you know, yeah. yeah. It's always that to taint it, and that's unfortunate, too. And he's dead now, too, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know. The last time I saw him was on Deadwood, I remember. Um, we're both clicking our, our keyboards here to find out. Yeah, we are. Nope, Jones, he's no, alive. he's still with us. Right. He is 71 years old. Uh, and it's unfortunate, too, because I really I, I like Jeffrey Jones in a lot of things. He was in, of course, Ferris Bueller's Day Off here, Beetlejuice, Hunt for Red October, mm. Deadwood, Amadeus. Got nominated for a Golden Globe for Amadeus. He was also in that wonderful movie, Howard the Duck. He comes to their house. He offers John Ritter this incredible satellite package with this enormous dish that goes out in the front, on the front lawn, and this big screen TV, like a really huge TV that probably isn't as big as it would be in real life, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a huge tube television. So he's he, he takes this package. He starts flicking through it. It start, starts offering ridiculous programming that we know we've never heard of. 666 channels, Three Men and Rosemary's Baby, uh, <laughs> sadistic hidden videos. A lot of this stuff really plays a lot like Saturday Night Live sketches or something. And it's very dated. Like you know, yeah. if you were you're a kid now or somebody somebody doesn't remember all that stuff, you're kind of you kind of lost on it. It, it doesn't it doesn't uh, doesn't do much for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like like there's you know, a couple of thirty I, something to thirty life, something to you know, life. Like, there, like who the hell remembers thirty? Yeah, something but there's except, there's some you know. there's some iconic stuff going on in there, like the the Max Hell commercial. Remember the Max Hell yeah. where he the, the usual sir, and then he plays it, and the guy's head comes off. I thought that was funny. The usual sir, please. Oh, 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 
them up for those long, tedious car trips. You need the silencer of the lambs. Driving will never be the same. The silencer of the lambs. Silencer of the pets sold separately. And now, get in shape with the exercises. Come on, people. Let's get in shape. Come on. Make it burn. Feel it burn. Good, Doreen. Okay, everybody. Head spin. With me. Ready, go. Very good. Very nice. I like it. Hey, kids, now there's a new beer just for you. It's got no alcohol, but it'll make you act just like your dad. Give me another one, babe. That's my boy. Yogi Beer, you'll be just like your dad. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then there was my th- <laughs> my three sons of bitches. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of clever. <laughs> um, but in, they're having Driving another fight Daisy. because, yeah. because uh, Pam and John are, uh, you know, uh, Pam's pissed off with John. The, the satellite dish sucks them into the television where they have to participate in a game show called You Can't Win. Oh, oh no. Obviously, we just lost the satellite feed. That sucks. Next, they wind up in a wrestling match. Then the, we have the Max Hell commercial and then a show called Northern Overexposure, which is dated. That's very dated because a lot of people don't know yeah, about yeah, it. Nobody remembers Northern Exposure. I remember Northern Exposure being popular for about five seconds and then being canceled. His name was Julio Iglesias. You tell me, what is the issue? He's a fag. 34 minutes in, the kids have no idea what's going on. We get our premise. This is satanic television. Apparently, when John Ritter signed the contract for the satellite gear, he entered into this um, contract with the devil or something like that. Jeffrey Jones plays Spike. I had to, you know, I was so confused by the movie because too much was happening. It was too chaotic and not enough story. Just, Just mainly, like I said, the Saturday Night Live gags. So I had to look it up. Well, I was like, it seems to me that there was some editing that went on or maybe some fights after after shooting finished. Like they they they, they cut a lot of stuff out of it. You could tell. I feel yeah, I feel like, that way. It looks expensive. The movie looks really expensive and it's only and, uh, 90 minutes long. That's usually a bad sign. Well, I mean, I I'm all for movies being as close to 90 minutes as possible. So I don't Yeah, wanna, yeah, I don't but I felt that. like we don't, you know, I mean like where where what are we telling the story of? Are we telling the story of the crazy sketches that that the crazy uh, stuff the TV I think, shows? Are? I think that they explored the 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 devil angle more and Spike's role and and this this black guy who was trying to take over for him. Right. Uh, uh, it, like like I think that a lot of that ended up on the cutting room floor. I guess they figured it didn't work. They, they, you know, the people didn't care about that. They cared more about the heroes and stuff. They didn't want to like learn about the villains. Maybe, maybe they were spending too much time there. I, I don't know. Uh, but it seems to me like a lot of that went, went, went on the cutting room floor because it's all cut to shit. And it seems like there's this whole story going on back there that we don't get half. Yeah. Of. Yeah. But there is a nice little bit where he winds up in three's company, which I thought was hilarious. I had to look it up in the Wikipedia. Uh, basically, yeah. what the hell was going on here? Um, Spike, who is Jeffrey Jones's character, is an emissary from hell who wants to boost the influx of souls by arranging for TV junkies to be killed in the most gruesome and ironic situations imaginable. This has a very high concept feel to it. <laughs> uh, the candidates are sucked into a hellish television world called Hell Vision and put through a gauntlet where they must survive a number of satirical versions of sitcoms and movies. If they can survive for 24 hours, they're free to go. But if they get killed, their souls will become the property of Satan. The latter usually happens. Uh, There is a a very nice, impressive, impressively animated sequence where uh, John and Pam are transformed into mice in a cartoon. And John gets a great line where he says, this is one clever pussy because they're being chased by a cat, which I thought was. Yeah. yeah. Um, Now I can see now. And I'd like to just let me add something there. Um, I, I, I when I, I watched this again after after many many years, and I swear that I remember more of the kids being in the movie like being in the TV world, and and I, I realized that maybe I saw it in a trailer, where the kids and the kid with glasses yes. was a cartoon character also, but that's not in the movie. So uh, so I, I think there was a lot of shit cut. I must have seen it in a trailer at some point. Um, yeah, it's that um, that does happen a lot where a trailer is cut before final cut is is made, and they'll throw in scenes and bits, and you'll find like um, bits from trailers that are not yeah. in the movies. Um, yeah, a lot of times. Yeah, 
that happens happens fairly often and uh and i think that 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 happened here also so i think that there, there's a lot of stuff that was cut out of this movie i'd love to know more about yeah, it. yeah i would too um well, unfortunately, all we have is like this 90 minute version that looks really great in high def. I got to say, it looks fantastic. Well, you could ask Peter <clears throat> Himes. He's got nothing to do. He's not working these days. <laughs> this movie is a kind of a disjointed mess, but like I said, it's beautifully shot. And I can see why Peter Himes wanted to direct the movie because it gives him a great deal of creative freedom. He employs numerous visual styles. The movie's never boring, but it is one long no. episodic uh, journey. It just goes from one thing or another. Their son. Um, Telegraphed early on as an electronics genius, attempts to save his parents. John, John and Pam live through the deadline, but Jeffrey Jones finds a technicality in a contract which frees him but retains his wife. But she didn't sign any contract, so that's a bit of a hole in the logic there. Well, a little bit, but he can do whatever he wants. So, like, it's kind of what it's kind of his his attitude. And um, there was a there's a line that somebody says where they say, "Holy Shatner," which I thought was clear. Yeah. And then uh, we, uh, for some reason, John Witter, Ritter winds up in a Salt and Peppa video, I think. And he's dressed yeah. up like Prince from that video, uh, Get Off, which I was just like, what? Right. So it's a cute diversion, but it missed, for me, it missed a great satirical opportunity to tell a story that would make you think. But technically, it's a brilliant achievement. It's really good visual effects, incredible cinematography. When I think of movies that were shot in 1992, this is one of the ones that's, that's actually shot really well. I, you know, I, I, you know I, I don't hold it quite as in high esteem in that regard as you do um I, because i mean uh, it looks to me like they they ran it through they, they they certainly did a lot of a lot of different techniques in order to get different looks for different tv shows that they were going in and out of and that, that, that i appreciate that but i don't think it really came together into anything that was noteworthy Right at the end of the well, I, I just, I would, you know. that's why I say the only thing of note is the photography. Even then, you even have then, to, you have to still... take it apart, to put, throw the story away. Don't even look. Turn the volume down and just watch the images. They're incredible. I do still enjoy watching it once in a while, though. I will say that you know, I I, I didn't. I this didn't was a, this was an interesting it. period for John Ritter because he had enjoyed a resurgence as a film actor. He had been in Problem Child, yeah. which became an, a, a surprise hit. And then he appeared yeah. in a uh, Blake Edwards movie called Skin Deep. Uh, that, was, that was an interesting movie. And a couple of other ones, too. It's, it's very interesting. Um, the glow-in-the-dark condoms were funny. <laughs> the glow-in-the-dark condom, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the one thing you remember about that movie, actually, is the glow-in-the-dark condom. Well, no, that, that and, the, and the, um, the, the bodybuilder chick. Mm, the bodybuilder. Where she's, like, the, like flexing her muscles. And right. Like, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and still... Uh, 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 and he like fucks her. Anyway. He's all... <laughs> but again, skin deep, problem child, and 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 um, stay tuned. Uh, they really highlight his physical talent as an actor. He's he's very, he he's very physical, especially like you know back in the day. He's, he was terrific. He really was. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I think I, the, probably probably the best movie role that he's done is is one of his last, which was uh, Bad Santa, like, where they really showed off a lot of his talent. Bad Santa. Um, I was gonna say Sling Blade. He was in Sling Blade, and he did a really good job in that movie. Too. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, truly underrated actor. We we did a thing for Two Davids Walking to a Bar, a movie that he did back in 1978 with Carrie Fisher called Leave Yesterday Behind. I enjoyed him in the movie. He was trying to stretch and be dramatic in the movie. But it, it was okay. He was okay. Now, moving on to Time Cop, 1994. Jean-Claude Van Damme, who talks like this all the time. What do we got? Partner, ex-partner. Let me go, Max. Like I'm not hurting anybody. Got to take you back. In the year 2004, time travel is a reality. You are charged with violations of TEC code 40.8. Time travel with intent to alter the future. And a crime. It turns out going back in time is a pretty easy way to make money. I think you got yourself a shipment of gold. You're taking a general lead. The genie is already. 
already out of the bottle. The technology is there. Now, one man. You ever hear the name Aaron McComb? Is about to take the ultimate power trip. He's going to be president. You don't need the press. You don't need endorsements. You don't even need the truth. You need money. But to enforce the laws of time. Are we still together in 10 years? Am I dead? One man is determined to stop him. I cannot go back to save her. This scumbag is not going back to steal money. Stay here, Walker. My future, you're dead. I think you planned too far ahead. Jean-Claude Van Damme. Ron Silver. Will you get up? Mia Sara. <laughs> <laughs> we will barbecue hot dogs together uh, i cannot serve this <laughs> uh time cop i now i remember when i did you ever hear that that was that was a uh, that was a um a little rip from uh kevin pollack he's like jean-claude van damme sounds like four chefs who screwed up the soup for three <laughs> chefs jean-claude van damme i cannot serve this <laughs> Um, okay, so Jean-Claude Van Damme. Okay, I'm not a big Jean-Claude Van Damme guy. This is the one movie of his that I really enjoy. Uh, I, he had actually, during that time period, okay, I have in my notes, I enjoyed several movies of his within a specific time period. Universal Soldier with Dolph Lundgren, I really enjoyed that. Enjoyed Nowhere that to Run with Roseanne Arquette, I like that one too. I enjoyed that. Hard too. Target, John Woo. Yeah, time cop and sudden death, and then after that, it drops off. Yeah, no, that was that was when his whole his whole career kind of dropped off. He started to get old. But he made like, these movies made money. They were he was a big box office yeah. draw for a little while. He was kind of like you know what he was. He was kind of like a leaner, more muscular Arnold Schwarzenegger, good looking, uh, better looking Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, but I'm I'm scared to go back and watch him after the way I felt about Time Cop because Time Cop was always, well. I mean, you know, what did you think? Me, time Cop was awesome, but I went and watched it this time, and I have to say, I don't think it. So held you up. liked it when you first saw? I remember loving it. I loved it when I first saw I it. I loved it. I loved it. For me, it. it was palatable in the sense I'm not big on I'm not big on uh, fighting movies. I'm not big on martial arts movies. My brother-in-law is a big martial arts nut. He like has all the old. Like I don't know, drunken master Jackie Chan kind of stuff. Well, I'm not big on that stuff either. Although Jackie Chan is a, is a, is is a, is is his own mm-hmm. thing. He's he's amazing, but but I'm I, I you know I'm not I'm not big into into martial arts movies. Yeah, either. I mean this is, it's fighting. I I don't know that I'm. I, what I like is a. But I love Bloodsport. You know, I like I was a Van Damme fan from 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 the start. You know, Bloodsport and Cyborg and uh, the early stuff that that he did. Yeah. Um, I was totally into that. But yeah, and 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 um, what's that Cyborg directed by Albert Pune, right? Cyborg was directed by Albert right, Pune. Yeah. He's always. About it on Facebook now because everybody else is talking about it, so he's like shocked to like, why are people still talking about this? Yeah. <laughs> so okay, we start off in Georgia, eighteen sixty three. It looks like a Civil War movie once again. Excellent cinematography. I love the way he shoots a movie. I really seriously yeah, love it, the way. Yeah, he's got some fails in this movie. A lot of fails. yeah, but so, photo- photo- photographically wise though. Yes. I can't yes. imagine. I love the way he shoots. The lighting in in the twenties and the uh, also also the acting. Every everything about being in the twenties doesn't ring true at all. <laughs> well, I I think I think what that might be is just you throw everything in there and it's over the top. It's like a kitchen sink. And you put Jean Claude Van Damme in there, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe maybe. But I, I thought that the, the 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 lighting the lighting there was over the top. The color saturation was over the top. Um, Were you looking at an HD print? Because I was looking at an HD. Yeah, I was looking at HD. Print. I did. It looked great to me, man. This is film, man. I mean, this is like I, I didn't see any saturation. I, I actually I saw mine was it looked very evenly balanced to me. It didn't look oversaturated or anything to me. I said I it's old. Was, I even have it in my notes. I said this is old fashioned Hollywood cinematography. These movies just look plain, plain better than movies being shot today with the oversaturation. Maybe saturation is the wrong word. Just the the, 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 the the color schemes that they were using did not feel right to me that they were what they were shooting. It, it felt wrong. It felt out of place. Mm. Okay, so... Uh, and I'm, I'm, I, It's hard for me to talk about that because I don't see color the way everybody else does. But for me, it was... It made it uncomfortable... Um, and not natural. 
and then there was some very unnatural acting in well, from 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 some of some of the there's supporting a few, characters. Yeah, there's a and few people. It's also, over the top. You also, you know, Van Damme, who's definitely you have like, a movie. I mean, well, you, know, you have okay. Albert Pune coaxed better better fucking uh, acting out of him than 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 Hyams did in this movie. I I I don't know what was going on there because I think when you cast. John Connor Van Damme in a movie like this, you have to populate him with other people. It, it, putting Ron Silver in the movie was a benefit to it and sells that end of the story. So you don't give Van Damme a lot of dialogue. Instead, you have him simply reacting and then fighting his way out of any given situation. It's kind of like how they do it with Schwarzenegger. You know what I really got from this movie? I want it to be remade with somebody <laughs> else. Because I think it would actually be awesome. I feel like I this that... has been done, though. I mean, I, I when this movie came out, the, the, there's another movie that reminds me of it. It's Minority Report, a little bit. Although that's not so yeah. much about time as it is about, yeah, it's about memories and intent. But it, Steve Spielberg crap. But it gives... That. But that. It's, it's sort of the same. And there's the, 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 the idea about time cops is that they go back in time to chase criminals who are inflicting damage in the past that will right. somehow make their futures turn out better and ron silver is behind a lot of this too but first we established john claude van damme the, the story the story of van damme his character who his wife has died and he 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 can't because because he has respect for the way the time system works yeah. he can't go back and save his wife um but he watches all these bad guys go back and do it go back and do whatever the hell they want to yeah. do and that's and he stops them and like like that that is a story that that that, that could be told in any number of ways. Yeah, and yeah. Remade. I agree. I agree. And and I, I think I think you know they they could make a they could really make a new franchise out of it and like the, it would be le a legitimate thing, more legitimate than some of the other remakes. Did they make any been, sequels like, to this? Uh, I believe they did, didn't they? It, it seems like they might have. Without without Van Dam, I'm surprised he didn't sign on for one. Time Cop 2, The Berlin Decision, with Jason Scott Lee and Thomas Ian Griffith. Uh, that's right. And, I do like Thomas Ian Griffith. And then there was a um, TV series which starred Ted King, Don right. Stark, and Kurt Fuller, uh, which ran... I like Kurt Fuller, it, too. They only ordered 13 episodes, but only nine were aired, so... It was on ABC. See, today, Time Cop, if they made a series out of it and put it on Netflix, it would be the biggest thing. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with that, yeah. Um, but I did enjoy. I mean, I, there's a lot to like about the movie. There's uh, there are some really good action sequences. We have Mira Sarah, who's gorgeous. I love her eyes. She has a strangely exotic quality. She's there's a very a lovely uh, love uh, 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 love making scene between them. Beautifully shot. Again, it reminds me a little bit of the Terminator, except it's a little more physical. Um, yeah. There's never enough time. Never enough for what? To satisfy a woman. Then you never want to miss an opportunity. Are you busy? I'm meeting my husband. If I were him, I would not keep you waiting. If he's not here when I turn around, I'll go home with you. You'll do. <laughs> I didn't hear you leave this morning. It was early. I was meeting with Matuzak. Are you going to take that job? What? Be right back. Read it. Wolverine, between the lines. I should get the fuck out of here. Good. You know that purse? Doesn't look good on you. <laughs> and then uh, these thugs in long coats with long guns with mullets, uh, you, you know, uh, sucker punch him. Uh, they blow up his house. They kill Mia Sarah. And then we go forward into the future uh, to 2004, and a stock trader manipulates the market uh, right before the, the, the market crashed in the Boring 20s that we were talking about um, with information from the future. It turns out that the trader is uh, the guy who's doing it is his former partner. I guess this is an occupational hazard. <laughs> so we get into yeah. we, we get into this thing. They arrest this guy, bring him back to the future, try him, convict him, and then send him back as he's about to fall. 
uh, he falls right. from this uh, from this building and crashes to the ground or hits a car or something like that. Uh, so I w- I'm going to talk a little bit about the fight scenes. You said you had a problem with the fight scenes anyway. But I was thinking they kind of – I thought that they were very badly done, badly blocked, badly filmed. I, 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 I think a lot of it reminded I, me of John Woo. There's some slow motion. There's uh, flying past bullets, precisely edited. There's some good visual effects in there too. I, I wasn't seeing them. I don't know. I, I was I was watching like you know Jean-Claude Van Damme sort of like looking like – he was moving a knife back and forth while somebody was hitting that knife and like they weren't actually fighting and it was uh, disappointing and, and, and bad. <laughs> I, I was, I, I was, I, you know, I, I, I was, I was really let down by this because, cause th- this is a movie that I always thought that I really liked and, and, and I was kind of shocked by my reaction to it. I, I have to say, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't, but uh, it didn't, report, it didn't hold up well for you. my, uh, yeah, for for me it really didn't, and I and I don't take any pleasure from that. So let me see, JCVD. I keep calling him JCVD rather than the full oh, name. Yeah. Did he call himself that for? A while? Now, did you notice their right. television sets are Panavision? Apparently, oh, yeah. <laughs> widescreen tubes yeah. because it's a Panavision world we're living in. Apparently, and I was thinking Minority <laughs> Report steals a few details from this movie. Yeah, uh, mainly like home video and stuff. He's looking at home video of his dead wife or something, but you know, Tom Cruise's wife isn't dead in that movie. She's just estranged from him. We get some nice half-naked shots of his uh, posterior with his magnificent sculpted ass. He, he, there's a great bit where they try to tase him, but there's water on the floor, so he jumps up on the counter of the kitchen and spreads his legs between both ends of the counter to avoid the water. This guy winds up... The split is his move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, that's pretty good. I was... Uh, yeah. Now... It was, that, that was okay. It's still like I, I had my issues with the rest of the fight scene there, but like that that part that part was handled okay. I was I was really shocked at like how bad the scenes looked, like I, I, how bad the fight scenes. Looked. Oh, okay. Well, I I I really enjoyed them. I, I thought it was a nice. I thought it was um, refreshing. I guess to see it pass. It some... seemed to me like it like it worked on the small screen when it was pan and scan, but like when you're you're watching the, the watching it in HD, it just didn't didn't fucking make oh. it. it. Just didn't fucking. Like it wasn't filmed for that, maybe I, I don't know. Now, can we let's talk about Ron Silver, who is really uh, great in uh, this movie. <laughs> he is fantastic. He really, is. he kind of makes the movie. He always he's did. such a yeah. he's such a bad guy, and he's such a scenery chewer. He establishes his yeah. character within seconds. You know, yeah. he goes back in the past uh, to meet up with his younger self. Tells him to lay off the fucking candy bars. <laughs> He says, he says, and he says, would you not interrupt me, interrupt me when I'm talking to myself? Uh, meanwhile, John claude Van Damme shows up with his new partner, played by Gloria Rubin, who I always get confused with Radon Chong. They look very similar. She was, I thought, miscast in this. She she really didn't. Uh, well, that when was she turns another, on him, uh, she turns on him eventually. Uh, it was just, she, she just, the, the acting, she, she just didn't seem to have it right. Like, like she, she wasn't, wasn't. I mean, you know, I just I am just looking at my notes here. Like there's a scene with a naked chick writhing around on a bed and that chick isn't even hot. Like 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 how do you fuck that up? Like like, like <laughs> I don't know, maybe Did you, may- you you know what I'm talking about? Like 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 there's like there's a scene it's like towards towards the beginning where like 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 he's having a um I think it's like a dream and there's like this this like chick naked chick on a bed. And like she's got fugly teeth and she's ugly. Really? I d- no, I didn't notice that. Oh, uh, maybe. Right. Well, there's that, and Gloria Rubin is like totally, in my opinion, miscast. Maybe, like, maybe in 1994 did. she was hot, and in 2017 yeah. she's not. <laughs> maybe, maybe in non HD. I was like, maybe it's like a HD. No, thing. maybe. Yeah, know. yeah, maybe. I also thought that the tech was badly imagined and the cars looked silly. And why do you need this weird machine to race towards a concrete wall to go back in time when you could just push a button later to go back? It doesn't make yeah, any sense. Yeah, I know, sense. I know. That is, that is. Demolition Man did a much better job of, of imagining tech than this movie did in about the same time period. Yeah. Uh, I also wrote the. Ah, well, we already talked about everything else. I, I said that, that that if you wanted to look to a movie that really did the twenties right, um, like what I'm talking about, like I thought that the that the uh, the twenties didn't ring true, and that a movie like The Shadow really did a good job at making the twenties ring true. And this movie, The Shadow, that didn't. was that Alec movie, Baldwin. The Shadow's at ninety four with Alec Baldwin, uh, Russell Mulcahy, Russell Mulcahy, and like and it did did a better job of of making the twenties ring hmm. true than than. 
than this movie did. And, and you know, the twenties are a tiny part of this movie, but it, like for me, it was a bothering thing. It was like jarring. I don't okay. know. Why. Um. But anyway. In short order, uh, Gloria Rubin betrays John Claude Van Damme and is herself killed by Ron Silver. You can't make bargains with evil people. It just doesn't work out. John Claude Van Damme gets no. back to 2004 and Silver is more popular than ever as a presidential candidate. Unfortunately, because the past was changed, the future was changed. Uh, so this is when Van Damme decides, fuck it, I'm going to save my pregnant wife's life. He finds out that she was pregnant at the time that she mm -hmm. was killed and preventing her execution. There are some problems for me involving the younger Jean-Claude Van Damme. Would not the future Jean-Claude Van Damme cease to exist because he changed his timeline? Instead, he goes forward in time, and I keep wondering why the, where's past? There are two Jean-Claude Van Dammes. There shouldn't be, right? And then, right. And then we, already, uh, we also have this establishing ma matter cannot occupy identical space, and we see what happens when Ron Silver and Ron Silver come into contact with each other. They turn into primordial right. soup and disappear. That that was the thing that bothered me. You know, the, your, your roaring 20s bothered you, but what bothered me about this, in time travel paradoxes, you can't have two two identical people. It's not like right. there are any rules, but it is a paradox because it's not supposed to happen that way. He winds up saving his wife's life, preventing them from dying, and also saving the younger Jean-Claude Van Damme, which means there are two Jean-Claude Van Dammes. It makes no sense to me. Well, the the original Jean Claude Van Damme lived anyway. The, but then what happens though? We didn't see anything. There's nothing to indicate to me that both Jean Claude Van Dammes merged into one Jean Claude Van Damme. You know? Well, they, they didn't have to though. But 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 because the, like the the in the in in the first timeline. Okay, let's say when 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 the wife died, like the the Jean Claude Van Damme in that timeline lived. So if he lived, so then he, he didn't really change anything in regards to that Jean Claude Van Damme. But if he lived, that means he lived. She had her baby. They have a son now who wants well, to barbecue hot dogs. No, 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 no. He, but, but, okay. So yeah, that 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 changed. Mm -hmm. But but you, you're saying that like he saved the other Jean Claude Van Damme, but the other Jean Claude Van, what Van Damme to lived him? anyway. He goes back. He goes to. He goes back to 2004. He he sees that his wife is alive and that he has a child. He ceases to exist. That timeline. But ends, I didn't right? see him ceasing I mean, to exist. I just saw him going inside. They're going to make some hot hot dogs. Remember? Well, maybe maybe everything changes in his mind as to how it. I, I, yeah, I, I, exactly. See, see, you're stumped. You uh, can't figure it out. Uh, I thought it was great fun. I don't know, you know, but if I, I might do it myself if I had the opportunity and like see what happened. If everything <laughs> changed in my head as to what I remembered, and and I just go in and make. Hot We've already thoughts, established and, eh. that you can have a Ron Silver from the future and a Ron Silver from the past, so there should right. be two Jean Claude Van Dams, but we never see, we never, we never get to that point. I don't know that there should be two Jean Claude. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thought it was great fun, high concept, great explosions and stunts. Reminds me a little bit of Back to the Future, parts one and two. No. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it still held up for me. If it didn't hold up for you, I I don't know. I'm sorry that it didn't hold up for me. I, I, I was I was disappointed, um, but no, it didn't hold up for me. So I was, and I was kind of shocked at that because I was really expecting to to watch something like be, and be, you know, like drawn back into it. And I wasn't. It was kind of disappointing. All right. Uh, now, just a little bit on um peter hyams i just want to talk about some of the movies that we didn't talk about oh, yeah. that i really did enjoy um i really enjoyed uh let's see where are we you you told me you found like a very obscure movie that he made called busting from uh, 1974 oh yeah yeah with uh with elliot gould and uh some some somebody else uh, the other guy uh, uh robert blake the guy who killed his robert wife blake. yeah yeah Robert Ellen Blake. Garfield, Antonio Fargus, who was in in uh, what was that movie? <laughs> yeah, it's like what that's, was that movie? Uh, the whatever, McNaughton, right? McNaughton, The Borrowers. Yeah, The Borrowers. Yeah, he was in that. Antonio Fargus and Sid Haig, Michael Lerner, people like that. Yeah, this is this is a low budget kind of a cop movie. It was the inspiration it's, for Starsky and Hutch. I would say it's not totally low budget. It's actually pretty well done, um, and. It's got it's got a good budget, and when there were one of the reasons why I downloaded it to, to to watch it in the first place was because it was shot somewhere that I visited in L.A. and I wanted to see what it looked like in the mm -hmm. '70s, and and uh, it didn't disappoint. It's uh, well shot, of course, because it's a Peter Himes movie and he shoots all his own stuff, um, and uh, good 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 movie. It was kind of, kind of fun. It's it's you know it's it's a '70s movie. 
But it's they're not like as bad a, it's as they used this, to be uh, because now we can watch them in HD. That music that's like waka chica, waka chica, waka chica, waka chica. There's there's waka chica <laughs> and there's and there's like you know and pointless nonsense and and noises that are that are going off in the background to annoy mm-hmm. you while you're watching the movie. Like, I don't know why they thought that was a good idea, but like it's funny. It's funny to me when people you know they go, oh man, the, the, the movie industry peaked in the 1970s. It's like yeah, like like when 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 they would like put a horn on and after a car accident for you to sit there and listen to it for five minutes straight. Yeah, that was a great idea. You know, it's like yeah. let's just <laughs> like force everybody to walk out of the fucking theater because they they're annoyed by the sound of our movie. Mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it was it was an enjoyable little little movie. It was a good good um, um, high testosterone movie. Um, I did like I. Uh, there's a bunch of movies here that he did that played on cable. Yeah. Capricorn One, uh, Hanover Street. I never saw Capricorn. It's one. an okay movie. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, Hanover Street with uh, Harrison Ford, Leslie Ann Warren, Outland, which we talked about before. Star Chamber, which yeah. I, I I love the Star Chamber. It's it's just a uh, I, I tried to watch that. It's a good one. It's it's Michael Douglas plays a judge who's pissed off because because the bad guys keep getting away on technicalities. His his mentor Hal Holbrook says, you know, we do something about it. And he says, what do you mean? He says, well, we have this thing. It's called the Star Chamber. We pick out cases that we you know where there's the preponderance of evidence against. Against the bad guys, we go. We 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 uh, commission an assassin to go and murder that person, and justice is served. And he winds up getting too much into it because he figures out, wait a minute, there's a flaw in the system. These guys didn't actually do it, so it becomes a running type movie. You know, it's a, a lot of running type stuff. And then we have um, yeah. 2010, the year we make contact, starring Roy Scheider again. Uh, oh, yeah, that's now, right. He did. Uh, he did as that. you know, I'm a big fan of Stanley Kubrick, but. I like this movie nah. better than 2001. I really do. I like this movie a lot more than 2001 because I can understand this movie a lot uh, more. And also, I just like the characterizations. It's a very human movie. It's a great great science fiction movie and a very human movie. And also, it was a very big hit, too, when it came out, actually. Um, cool. And then after that, he made Running Scared, which uh, was also uh, which also made money. It, was a, it, was, it wasn't like a, an, an enormous hit, but it, was, it did make its money. And then after that, he made the Presidio. Was that with Christopher Lambert? No, uh, the Presidio is. I'm um, thinking of something else. Uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm, it's uh, Sean Connery and Mark uh, Harmon, Mark Harmon, and Meg Ryan, and Meg Ryan. Yeah, okay. I'm thinking of the Sicilian, which was. Uh, oh yeah, that was that was Russell Bouquet who did that, or no? Who I did think, that? Oh no, that um, was that, the Sicilian was was Chimino. Right, yeah. yeah, sorry. Why did I think Russell Russell Bouquet? Oh, because you were thinking of Highlander. Highlander. Islander. Yeah. Um, and then he did Narrow Margin, which you've talked about. Yeah, that is which was which was actually really well done and it deserves to be looked. Gene at. Hackman and Ann Archer, uh, and James B. Sicking, who was in Star Chamber. We have Stay Tuned, Time Cop. We have Sudden Death, the other movie he made with Jean Claude Van Damme, which I did enjoy. Something about a hockey game. I recall really enjoying that too. But now, now that I've seen Time Cop again, I now you're gun shy. Visit you're gun shy. Yeah. And I saw the Relic when it came out in the theater. I, I did enjoy that because it's just a good old fashioned monster movie. Yeah. And uh, what's his name is in that? Um, the guy that the meth head guy. Crazy Tom Sizemore. Right. Yeah, Tom Sizemore. And then after that, he did End of Days, which I. I didn't really like. I didn't like. I that. rented it. We, me and Brahman watched it. I so wanted to like that. I but wanted it to like good. it too. You got Arnold Schwarzenegger. You got Robin Tunney, who I adore, and then you have Gabriel. Yeah, what's Gabriel Byrne like, playing the? How devil. did they fuck that up? How did they fuck that up? I, 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 you know, I was a little turned off when Gabriel Byrne had sex with a daughter and a mother at the same time. <laughs> oh Jesus! <sighs> That's disgusting. I thought that was a little <sighs> bit. Bleh. I don't remember when I turned that off, but it was early. It was early. And then uh, he made The Musketeer in 2001 with Catherine Deneuve, Mina Savari, no Stephen that. Ray, and Tim Roth. Um, and then after that, he, he made the unfortunate movie A Sound of Thunder, which was the movie that uh, was produced by Franchise Pictures. They lied about the budget. They never finished it, yeah. Yeah, and it was never – all the visual effects were not finished. Um, he And that was like basically where it ended for him, wasn't it? Well – I believe he okay. According to this, he made a movie called Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, which had Michael Douglas in it again from Star Chamber, Amber Tamblin, and Orlando Jones, and he shot that movie as well. He shot it as well as directing it. That's a American crime drama thriller from 2009, a remake of 
the film from 1956 by Fritz Lang. And that's r- r- roughly it. I mean, like his career kind of because because again, he's another he's another director like John Badham, who is a journeyman. So he just moves from one project to another. He never really had a home at any particular studio. Mm-hmm. If if he made a movie that was uh, successful financially, he was invited by the same studio to work again on another project. Like 2010 was a big hit, so he got Running Scared with MGM for that. Right. Um, but mostly he worked. He just works for a lot of different studios: Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, Universal, and MGM. All right, let's wrap this up. All I right, gotta clean up the kitchen, and I'm sweating for some reason. Maybe I'll open the window. Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol? All right. Good idea. Well, thanks. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for joining us in this discussion of Peter Hyams. Um, Next time we will be back with something. I'm not really quite sure yet. We're thinking about we're we're kicking around an idea, and we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, uh, we'll be back. I hope we'll be I back. Hope. We hope. There's always hope when you got water and soap. <laughs> I see. <clears throat> All right, Andrew. All right. It was good night. Good night. Good night. Yes. You have been listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legang and David Baller. 